Welcome to my talk. I'm going to go through it very quickly because I have a lot to cover and I know there are other talks some of you are running off to. So if I speak a little too fast, I apologize. Just remember it is All right. Taped. One man controlled Oswald's pre-assassination CI file, opened in 1963, three years before the assassination. He controlled the CI's flow of information to the Warren Commission. He made his close associate, Ray Rocca, the official Warren Commission liaison. He had a member of the Warren Commission in his will and carried that member's ashes when he died. Who was that? Alan Dulles. <laughs> had a member of the, uh, knew what to cover up even after the Warren Commission had finished. And I think that's significant. You'll see in here that some people know what to lie about and some people tell the truth because they don't know what to lie about. The ones who know what to lie about are closer to the center of the plot than the ones who don't know they should be lying. That just makes sense, right? All right, so who was Angleton? What did he know? What did he tell? And why does it matter, especially here in this day and age? All right, who was he? He was called the poet spy. He was extremely bright, but his Yale grades didn't necessarily reflect that. He was never very good at bowing to power, not in school, not ever after. <laughs> he liked the intricacies of language, which is why he was really attracted to poetry, saying something in words that were obtuse, that didn't say what, and this actually mirrored very much his interest in the intricacies of intelligence work. He was transferred to London thanks to his father who was in the OSS as a national cash register employee uh, and his recommended by his former uh, English professor Norman Pearson. That's where he met Kim Philby who was a high-level Soviet mole in the government, something Angleton never found out until it was exposed by others. Can you imagine the height of irony, a word we use a lot at this conference, that the head of the CIA's counterintelligence you know, responsible for keeping penetration from government for 25 years was the guy who couldn't figure out that Philby was a mole. His, his close friend, a guy he talked to very regularly, was a mole. I find that very ironic and it says a lot about the CIA. All right, he transferred to Rome as a commanding officer of SCIZ in World War II. Less than six months later, he became the youngest X2 chief in the OSS with Ray Rocca at his side. His deepest friendships were evidenced by their presence in his 1949 will. He was dramatic. He thought he could die at any moment. And they included Alan Dulles, Richard Helms, Ray Rocca, and Miles Copeland. He bred orchids. The reason this is significant is this is a man with long-term thinking. Most Americans don't think past a week, a month, maybe a year. Maybe they have a two or three year plan. Most people don't have a 12 year plan for their lives. Angleton did, all right? And he had a lot of long term plans. And it's worth thinking about that in the context of Oswald. He was Machiavellian. Early in his career, according to Miles Copeland, his close friend who knew him very well, uh, Angleton brought down the head of a rival intelligence unit in World War II, Stephen Penrose. Uh, who, according to Angleton and others, was generally thought to be too Christ-like for the spy business. In other words, nice guys aren't allowed, you know. So what did he do? He faked intel, all right? He copied data from the New York Times, fuzzed it up a bit, attributed it to a highly secret source, and used that to get even more money from Penrose to fund his, his special source. And then later, he told him that it was all phony and you could have bought that for five cents in the New York Times. Well, Copeland presents this as a jolly little escapade. Wasn't Angleton clever? And in a footnote, he goes, oh, by the way, Stephen Penrose almost had a nervous breakdown. I mean, that's really an awful thing to do. And it tells you, again, a lot about who Angleton is and what he was capable of doing. All right. <laughs> This is Hoover on the left, that is Congress on the right. Right after World War II, there was talk, should we have an ongoing intelligence agency? What about the OSS? And there were people who really didn't want a central intelligence agency formed. We had just fought the Nazis, the SS, they didn't want a secret police at home. All right, so how did the CIA get created over the objection of Hoover and over the objection of significant members in Congress? All right, well, there's two versions of that. The one you read in the books is the blue pill version, and it's actually the Alan Dulles version, according to Miles Copeland. He said Alan Dulles has said his version makes for better history. Oh, well, they were folded into the War Department, and then, you know, eventually Truman decided he needed his own intelligence service, and that's how it came about. All right, but Miles Copeland says he's telling us the red pill version, essentially. All right, and that is that somebody and I'm gonna say Angleton, blackmailed Hoover to silence him so that the CIA could go forward, and an army colonel who could also have been Angleton because actually he was an army colonel, although I, I know it wasn't, but I just wanted to mention that Angleton had ties to the army and that's significant. 
Uh, but an Army colonel ran an operation basically against Congress. He suborned secretaries. He got secret intelligence on members of Congress. And it's implied by what Copeland says that this was then taken to Congress and said, this is what a foreign intelligence agency could find on you, but we can protect you from all these secrets that could do you so much damage. Kind of a covert form of blackmail. So Hoover was silenced. All right, the colonel was fired, but the damage was done. Angleton continued to have bugs all over Capitol Hill. And he used to talk about it with Alan Dulles. And Tom Braden walked in and heard him talking about this. And he was actually kind of appalled. He said, God, Angleton is immoral. I mean, he's, he's using stuff they're saying about the CIA that could be used against Congress then. And in his book, uh, in fictional form, Miles Cop Copeland quotes, quotes mother, which is one of Angleton's code names, as saying penetration begins at home, and if we can't find out what's going on in the offices where our future is being planned, we shouldn't be in business. All right, everywhere implied in this is that Angleton was kind of controlling Congress by bugging them, looking for blackmail secrets. If somebody was going to challenge the CIA, who's going to find a way to silence them? It's worth remembering that, you know, as we get to the Warren Commission and the Church Committee, it's very obvious how some people could be persuaded to tell non-truths. And this, by the way, is why the NSA case today matters so very much. If the NSA can hear every conversation by everyone in this country at any time, they can find out who's sleeping with who, and they can use that against them to guarantee an ongoing budget increase. All right, this is actually incredibly dangerous, relevant, and it's a direct through line. 1947, 2014, you know, not a lot has changed, except that the secret government has gotten a heck of a lot bigger and more expensive to carry. All right, deception from inception. When the CIA was first finally formed, they didn't have a huge budget. So Angleton used news reports just like he had against Penrose. He fabricated intelligence attributed to secret sources, presented to Congress and said, look how much we know. And then they would go, wow, yeah, I read that in the paper. Your guy must really be in the inside. You know, I, I've seen that corroborated in the New York Times. Duh, it was the same source. Uh, after, after some early intelligence failures, as they were figuring out what to do, Albania was a disaster, they learned to highly compartmentalize operations, to use you know, pseudonyms, even within the agency, not to reveal agents' names. They knew how to keep everything super secret so that no one could leak plots out, and they got very good at it. They recruited journalists. That was among, quote, unquote, the CIA's most sensitive undertakings. Uh, they had contacts with the heads of news organizations that were normally initiated by Dulles himself and succeeding directors of Central Intelligence. I have a lot of stories about that. I'm not going to talk about that, and there's a whole panel later. But many of the best known journalists, I mean, we're talking big names, Walter Cronkite, Tom Broca. I'm not saying either of those two were CIA, but people of that stature were CIA said one unnamed official, one journalist is worth 20 agents. He has access and the ability to ask questions without arousing suspicion. Angleton specifically had his own completely independent source of journalists. All right, and uh, Carl Bernstein, who wrote about this in Rolling Stone in 1997, said that Angleton ran uh, operatives who performed sensitive and frequently dangerous assignments. So not just a journalist, but kind of journalist assassin types, maybe. Really dangerous stuff. Little is known about this group for the simple reason that Angleton deliberately kept the vaguest of files. All right, Angleton also was close friends with the guy who ran the New York Times editorial page from 1961 to 1976. Now, how many journalists do you need to control if you can control the opinion page of the New York Times, which kind of sets the tone for the rest of the media coverage in the country? That's incredibly significant. All right, so Angleton, he had overt and covert power. His overt power was that he had a huge counterintelligence. It was one of the biggest units in the CIA. He had over 200 people in it. This was the former, uh, originally called Staff A, which became counterintelligence. Then he had within that a little black ops unit, CI SIG. All right, that was his most trusted associates, Ray Roca, some of the others, very close in there. Actually, not Ray Roca, which is interesting. Um, he, but that unit conducted mole hunts within the agency. Angleton's empire even reached into Mexico City, where he sometimes used Ann Goodpasture for operations. And honestly, I know we're such a male-dominated society, but it's not inconceivable that Ann Goodpasture ran 
you know, something related to the assassination here. She connects with Angleton. She ran David Phillips' operations for him. She worked with Bill Harvey. And she couldn't remember where she was when she heard about the assassination. And in her case, that's especially suspicious because everybody cites her amazing memory that she was just somebody who never forgot anything. But that's one thing she couldn't remember. All right. Uh, was Angleton involved with coups and assassinations in general? Well, there have been allegations that he was. E. Howard Hunt, no less, uh, accused him of having run an assassination unit headed by Colonel Boris Pash early on to eliminate double agents in the CIA. That would explain the interface with the Office of Security, whose job was to silence, one way or another, <laughs> people who were talking to the outside about CIA operations. He used SIG to clear CIA staff to participate in staff D operations, which if you track the history of staff, staff D, that's basically the coup plotting part of the agency. All right, it also includes the NSA component. Uh, in 1963, he, in 1963, and again, not 1961, not 1962, after the Castro assassination plots had kind of ended, he goes with Bill Harvey to London to ask MI6 how to assassinate someone. All right, and they give him a bunch of advice. What about using the mafia? You know, maybe the French, you know, there are various options you could use. Uh, after the assassination, Helms, well, even before the assassination, Helms often asked John Witten, who's in the documents as Skelso. Uh, he asked John Witten to look into Angleton's operations when things didn't seem right, because Helms knew that Angleton would lie and make things up, and he would send Witten on his trail to find out what really happened. And, we, and Witten said he used to go in fingering his insurance policy, never knowing if he'd come out alive after meeting with Angleton. That's kind of interesting. I've never seen anybody say that about anybody else in the agency in any of the depositions. All right, and when Witten, after the assassination, Helms wanted him to, you know, look in the story of Oswald and, you know, talk to Angleton. He's like, will you back me to Angleton? And Helms is like, no way, <laughs> you know, you go do it, but I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell Angleton what to do. And in the end, Witten wrote a report that basically exculpated the Soviets, exculpated the Cubans, you know, and said it's clear that whatever happened, it wasn't Soviet inspired. Well. Of course, Angleton immediately got control of the investigation after that, because that was not a story that was going to sell in the way they needed to sell it. And I'll come back to that. All right, now, Bill Harvey's notes. The church committee found Bill Harvey's notes, handwritten notes about assassination plotting in general, that they had obviously made at some meeting. And it said, one, never mention the word assassination. Two, no projects on paper. Three, planning should include provisions for blaming the Soviets or the Czechs in case of a blow. Four, should have a phony 201 file in the central registry, all documents therein forged and backdated. And if you know anything about the Mexico City transcripts, that's John Newman's argument, which I subscribe to that those conversations didn't happen the way he said, you know, the documents say they happened, and that the transcripts were either wholly forged or partially forged. And they also said it should look like a CE file, meaning a counter espionage, counterintelligence file. And then he has Jim A. <laughs> That's Jim Angleton. <laughs> Strictly person-to-person -person singleton ops. So not covert operators with code names who've been on the books for years, singleton ops, people no one else in the CIA even knows about. That's what the recommendation was for assassination. And it's interesting that these notes, again, were written not later than January 26, 1961, as determined by the church committee. All right, so this part was before, you know, literally before Kennedy even took office. They were already talking about assassinations and how to do them and you know what what to go through all right so did angleton have singletons well it appears he might have and gordon novell who is a notorious liar who actually spent a lot of time with at one point he lived in las vegas and i ended up meeting him and we got together a few times and i just found him you know, a charming devil. <laughs> yeah. He was very interesting and funny, and he lied. But when he lied, his voice often changed dramatically. And I could see why the CIA wouldn't hire somebody like that, because it's kind of see-through. Uh, but when he wasn't lying, and I don't believe he was lying on this for a number of reasons I don't have time to go into, but he said Angleton personally showed him a photo of Hoover having sex with Tolson, and that that was the photo that had been used to blackmail. Uh, when During the Jim Garrison investigation, Gordon Novell sued Garrison because Garrison had said Gordon Novell was a CIA agent. 
And Hoover told Gordon, because he was also informing to the FBI and that's documented on the record, um, you know, Hoover told him, don't go after Garrison, don't make any noise, just go away. And Angleton said, no, you, sh you tell him you've seen that photo and you go talk to Hoover. So he finds Hoover at a local restaurant in New Orleans, you know, having dinner with Clyde Dawson. He goes up and says, I've seen the photo. <laughs> Hoover starts to choke on his food. And a uh, very funny story. If it was only Gordon Novell, I'd have to say a story, maybe true, maybe not. But there was another corroboration that's much more credible, and that was an OSS officer named John Whites, who told Anthony Summers that he too had seen the photo that Angleton used to basically hold over Hoover. All right, Jerry Patrick Hemming, who again, another notorious liar, somebody I would never believe unless I had other reasons to believe him. But in this particular case, he said he was one of Angleton Signaltons. He, has, uh, he said Oswald was too, and I will tell you this, that I saw a document I wasn't supposed to see, and I got it from the ARC. I actually went in person to the sponsoring organization for this conference one time when I was in DC, and they pulled down a you know, box of newly arrived files, and I just started going through them. They weren't indexed or cataloged yet, and out came this one page that was just littered with QJ slash this, QJ slash that, and real names beside it. It was a document that should never have been released, you know, by the agreements between the ARC and NARA. If something had both code names and real names, it was supposed to disappear. And so I showed it to somebody at the ARC and it instantly disappeared and I never saw it again. But I will tell you, QJ Wynn was not on that page or I would have found it because I was looking for that. But Jerry Patrick Hemming's name was. Now I didn't memorize his his thing, because when I gave it to somebody to copy, I thought I was going to get it back again. And I didn't think until I was on my way home to check my stack of documents, and that was not there. But he had a QJ alias. And that's interesting, because the CIA has always denied having a relationship with Jerry Patrick Hemming, and for the most part, he's denied it too. But he had a QJ alias. I think that's interesting. Anyway, this is something that Angleton said, which was. I believe after the fact, put off the record, but referred to in a later deposition with Angleton. At one point, they're honing in on him, you know, why did you lie about this? Why didn't you tell them about this? Why didn't you, you know, help the Warren Commission out? And he goes, well, it's inconceivable that a secret intelligence arm of the government has to comply with all the overt orders of the government. This is exactly how they think, and it's exactly what's wrong with the intelligence community as constructed. All right, I think we all agree we need a secret intelligence agency. I agree that, you know, we do. I understand, and they may have to do some nefarious things, but when Congress or the President asks to see data, we have to have some way of knowing we are getting the right answer. And without that, we cannot be a democracy. And then what's the point of having a CIA? Because there's nothing worth protecting. That's the problem. All right, so Angleton was an evil genius of sorts. He was able to control people in high places through taps and influential media assets. That can be as valuable as a bullet. All right, was feared even by his superiors. He ran his own private off the books operations. He had no compunction about lying to Congress to do what he perceived to be his job. And he was at the very least involved in gathering intel on how to assassinate someone and may have even been running his own assassination team. All right, meanwhile, in California, we got this guy. I'm a Marxist-Leninist. I don't enjoy discipline. I want to join Castro's revolution. Oh, and did I mention I'm learning Russian? Son, you're just what this country needs. Welcome to the United States Marine Corps. That's Oswald <laughs> going into the Marines <laughs> in the height of the Cold War. It's an impossible, impossible myth that a guy who's like overtly Marxist, who plays Russian operas, you know, in his barracks, <laughs> you know, doesn't come under suspicion or investigation, isn't kicked out as a traitor unless everybody knows he's an intelligence operative. That is the only way that story makes sense. The military is one of the most conservative organizations on the planet. That kind of behavior would not be tolerated or encouraged in any way. All right, so what did Angleton know about Oswald? What might the connection between them be? All right, well, Angleton's super secret SIG, that little black op organization within his bigger uh, empire, opened the official Oswald file not when he defected, offering up military secrets, a fact that was actually published in the Washington Post, which the CIA read daily and s copied and stored in their files, not when he talked to the CIA officer in the embassy, not when he talked to CIA witting collaborator, says her CIA file, Priscilla Johnson McMillan, in the Soviet Union. The file was not officially opened until a year later, and only after the State Department queried the CIA 
about recent defectors to the Soviet Union, because there was suddenly a whole slew of them, like 15 people suddenly defected to the Soviet Union at a time where all you heard in America was how terrible the Soviet Union was. Kind of hard to believe people would really defect there. And Otto Atepka, a state Department security officer also found that hard to believe. And so he asked the CIA, you know, tell me about these defectors because he assumed they were probably CIA agents. He wanted to know which are yours and which aren't. All right, as soon as he started questioning that, his career started taking a nosedive. His office was tapped, his garbage was, was gone through, his burn bags were, were sorted and collected. It was just a nightmare for him. And overtly, the story is, well, it's because he refused to clear Walt Rostow, the brother of Eugene Rostow, who had, by the way, been one of the people pressuring LBJ to form the Warren Commission. Walt Rostow was actually a CIA person, all right? But he was too liberal for Otto Atepka, so that's the official story, all right? But the, the other part of the story, which no one talks about, except for um, this is in... Spooks by Jim Hogan, H-O-U-G-A-N, a really interesting little book. Uh, but he had an unfinished study on Lee Harvey Oswald in his safe at the time that he was fired. He never got to the bottom of whether Oswald was CIA or not. And he was fired shortly before the assassination. So very interesting. Anyway, Angleton was very concerned about a possible mole in the U-2 program. All right, the CIA had learned that the Russians knew of this super secret plane flying overhead that they assumed was American. And so Angleton's like, oh my God, who in our U-2 program is leaking secrets to the Soviets? Now, he couldn't use any of his normal Soviet operatives to find out because any one of them could have been the mole. He needed somebody from the outside, somebody with provable knowledge uh, from inside the U-2 program. Gee, who could that be? <laughs> All right, <laughs> we got a little guy going to the Soviet Union as perhaps an intelligence dangle. The Soviets come up and sniff him. The guy says, I have something of special interest to share. And he's a former radar operator. And the Soviets go, do you think we're that stupid? And they don't really pursue Oswald. Now, that could mean two things. It could mean they really did have a mole in the U2 program. They didn't need any information from Oswald. Very possible. Or it could mean that Oswald was so obvious, everybody saw him for what he was right away, you know, either a nut or a CIA agent, in which either of which he wasn't going to be of any use to them. All right, in fact, Oswald had worked at not one, but two U-2 installations prior to his defection. And Atsugi was not just a base. It was definitely not just a military base. It was, in fact, a plush, super-secret cover base for the CIA's Tokyo Station Special Operations. All right, that's from a CIA officer who worked there, James Wilcott. He was a finance officer. He came in after Oswald had left, but a lot of the people working there remembered Oswald and had known him and talked openly about him, especially late at night when they were drunk, you know, and they had nothing else to do, and he worked the night shift. So people, you know, when they think they're in a trusted situation, Situation, they sometimes reveal secrets. All right, also, Oswald also worked at a QB point in the Philippines, which was actually a staging point for the CIA's operations against Indonesia in 1958. And again, Oswald left right before this operation happened. Uh, but while he was there, he'd, he found out something no one else had figured out, and his own commanding officer thought he was wrong at first. And he said, look, this thing just took off for, for Clark, and it's moving over China. He figured out that the CIA was flying the U-2 over China at a time when no one was supposed to know that. And so he got John Donovan, who John Newman interviewed, and this is a quote from his book, Oswald and the CIA. And I said, a week later, several of us began looking hard, and we saw it. Oswald was right. And we saw it so regularly, we started clocking them. I even called the duty officer about them, and he said, look, fella, there's no planes flying over China. This is the CIA lying to itself. One part of the CIA lying to another, saying, we're not flying over Cuba. And he said, we knew better. <laughs> we saw them all the time, mostly flying out of QB Point, but sometimes they flew out of car. So obviously, Oswald did have something of special interest to share. He was very good at his job. He found things other people who, who worked above him hadn't even noticed. He was a smart man. All right, the CIA's interest in Oswald clearly predated the opening of his 201 file. Again, it was opened in 1960, but he defected in 1959. And when Ann Edgeter was questioned in depth and at length, and by the way, I didn't realize the Edgeter interview was not on the Mary Farrell site, and I've had a copy for years. Uh, Jeff Morley queried me about it, so I instantly sent it to uh, Rex Bradford. It is now available through the Mary Farrell site. I recommend you all read it. 
Uh, but she scratches her head and she goes, you know, I've always wondered why this file came to CI SIG and why it didn't just go to the Soviet division. She said, because I eventually got most of my information about Oswald from the Soviet Union division. So that indicates Oswald went as a regular counterintelligence operation initially, and that's where the information was being kept either in the case officer's private file or in what they call a soft file that's not in the records integration division. All right, very significant. All right, here are some of the documents the CIA either had on file or certainly had access to before the opening of his file. And one of these is especially interesting because it's uh, this one. It's a naval message saying, oh my gosh, you know, this guy with radar, you know, access has defected. And at the bottom it says, intelligence matter, request significant develops in developments in view of continuing interest of headquarters, Marine Corps, and U.S. intelligence agencies, FBI, CIA, IANS, OSI, USAF, you know, blah, blah, blah. This was a big red alert. This was 1959. This is right after he defected. You just can't tell me the CIA just missed this. I don't buy that. All right. They are incompetent on small things. They don't usually miss something that big. <laughs> All right. Now, here's something else interesting. Oswald's historic diary, which we heard a little bit about last night. Um, easily findable online if you want to read the whole thing. He received 5,000 rubles from the Red Cross at the start of his trip at a time where an apartment could be rented in the Soviet Union for 70, bucks a mo 70 rubles a month. All right, he received 700 rubles a month for his factory job. That's a lot of money. But he continued to receive a matching 700 from the Red Cross. Now, Oswald was not a medical man. He was not a doctor. He was not a nurse. He didn't bandage people. Why is the Red Cross giving a defector to the Soviet Union money? All right, obvious question. Was Red Cross serving as a conduit for CIA funds? Very likely, yes. American Express did that too. They used to be able to pay their agents through American Express offices around the globe because there was one in every country. You know, so what kind of defector makes more money than the factory chief? This is a piece from his diary. I received a check from the Red Cross every month to help, you know, blah, blah, blah. I received a small flat, you know, almost rent free, 60 rubles a month. It is a Russian's dream. You know, he just, he was living high off the hog. Very difficult for, can you imagine if you went to Russia today and said, I want to defect, do you think the Red Cross would give you a few thousand dollars a month? Do you think, you know, <laughs> Soviets would instantly find you a job and give you a cheap apartment and pay you more than their factory director? This doesn't happen. This is a guy who's very well connected. All right, so. What makes more sense? The official story, Oswald the communist, an avowed lover of all things Russian, allowed to serve in the Marines, allowed to defect with secret U-2 knowledge, allowed to publicly announce that he was willing to give up items of importance to the Soviets in the U.S. Embassy where the CIA knew bugs were planted. All right, allowed to come home on a military hop. He actually came home on a military plane after having defected to the Soviet Union, given the equivalent of a month's salary each month by the Red Cross, and given aid by the State Department on his return. Does that make sense? No. What makes more sense is Oswald Angleton Singleton goes to the Soviet Union as an intelligence dangle to see if the Soviets bite on somebody with U2 knowledge. If they do, there's no mole. If they don't, there is. Knows how to get into the Soviet Union quickly through Helsinki, not common knowledge outside intelligence circles, is paid by the CIA through the Red Cross, is a vest pocket operative for Angleton. All right, and that's why Otto Atepka. This story makes sense. Every piece of the story suddenly fits if we look at it in that context. All right, similarly, Oswald in the FPCC, the fair play for Cuma. What makes more sense? Some unaffiliated nut tries to set up his own chapter for no reason. <laughs> the CIA goes on TV and says, I'm a Marxist-Leninist at a time in the US where that is guaranteed not to get you employment for the rest of your life. All right, and, and it just is a sheer coincidence that the CIA is running an anti-FPCC operation at the same time. Does that make sense? Or does it make more sense that Oswald was part of the CIA's operation against the fair play for Cuba committee? That explains why so many of his files have CI ops on them, counterintelligence operations. Explains his fight with CI asset Carlos Brunier and his subsequent appearance. It explains why Joe Anita's running Carlos Brunier would want to come in and shut down the HSCA when they started poking into his neighborhood. Explains why he became a patsy in the assassination plot. That's the ultimate way to discredit the FPCC. And wasn't that the first thing touted in all the newspaper? Oh, you know, this communist, you know, it was a fair play for Cuba member killed Kennedy. It's the ultimate discreditation operation. 
All right, so you get rid of both a hated president from the CIA's point of view and a hated organization in one fell swoop, a nice double, double whammy. All right, and what did Angleton have to do with Cuba operations or the Castro plots for that matter? Well, Witten said, I went to Colonel King, who was at the time the chief of the Western Hemisphere Division, and told him this, and JC, uh, he was saying, I heard there are these Castro assassination plots and what's going on. Oh, I'm sorry, no, this was where uh, Witten had found out that Angleton had forbid the arrest of some mobsters in Cuba. And King said, well, what do you expect? And I said, well, I don't know what to expect. And he said, well, you know, Angleton has these ties to the mafia, and he's not going to do anything to jeopardize them. And then I said, I didn't know that. And King told him, yeah, it had to do with Cuba. So Angleton had some connection with the mafia and the Cuban episode. And this comes up in some other files that I don't have time to go into. All right, now. When Kennedy takes office, it's late January 1961. All right, less, you know, about a month later, they're tracking minutia on Kennedy. Mr. Dulles, Jim Angleton called and advised that President Kennedy received his FBI briefing today. Can you imagine? That is like the most innocuous, inane thing. Why would the CIA be tracking Kennedy's every phone call, all right, right from the start? If they're doing this to Kennedy, they're, you got to know they're doing this to Obama. They're doing this to every president before and since, all right? How else can you control somebody if you don't know everything about them? All right, so three days before Dallas, guess who takes a rifle into the Oval Office? All right. <laughs> yeah, I, I know you know. <laughs> I know you guys know. <laughs> Uh, yes, Richard Helms walks in. He has this big old rifle. He met first with Robert Kennedy. He said, you better go talk to my brother. So he walks into the Oval Life. He's carrying a rifle. Imagine the implied threat. I can get to you at any time. Very intimidating. Most people would be intimidated by that. Kennedy had already faced down the CIA twice, Bay of Pigs and uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He was not intimidated. Helms gives him this fantastic story, and you've got to read Helms' own autobiography on this incident to appreciate the humor of it. Oh, we found this magic number that proved it was a Cuban rifle, but we could only photograph it because we had to apply a chemical to make the number appear, and then we photographed it right at the moment the number appeared, and then it disappeared forever, and now we can never find that serial number again. <laughs> and obviously, Kennedy is not buying it, and he puts him off, and he says, well, let's talk again when I get back from Dallas. On his way out the door, Richard Helms then stops and asks for an autographed picture of Kennedy. Helms did not like Kennedy, but Helms was a collector. Helms had Hitler stationery, all right? Helms knew if he didn't get a photo that day, he might never have another chance. Uh, right after the assassination, okay, this is again James Wolcott talking. He said, at, you know, right after Kennedy was killed, the mood was elation. Everybody was celebrating at the station. They were so happy Kennedy was killed until they heard the name Lee Harvey Oswald. And he said, and then the mood changed from elation to a more serious one. That was when I first heard about CIA somehow being involved. Not long before going off duty, talk about Oswald's connection with the CIA was making the rounds. Again, this is Atsugi. These are people who are just two years removed from Oswald who remembered him. All right. And uh, he said, this talk was a jolt to me. I didn't really take it seriously then. Very heavy talk continued up to about the middle of January. And he said, based solely on what I heard at the Tokyo station, the CIA station in Tokyo, I became convinced that the following scenario is true. CIA people killed Kennedy. Either it was an outright project of headquarters with the approval of McCone, or it was done outside, perhaps under the direction of Dulles and Bissell. It was done in retaliation to Kennedy's reneging on a secret agreement with Dulles to support the invasion of Cuba. I'm sure that's what Dulles told people, that he had a secret agreement. He did not have a secret agreement. And in fact, Kennedy you made that very clear to them several times. I will support a native uprising, but no American troops. And when the you know people were getting killed at the Bay of Pigs, and the CIA was begging him, "Look, we've got the you know the Navy is right offshore; they can come support us." And Kennedy said no. And Eisenhower had never said no in those instances, and they just didn't dream. I think bottom line that Kennedy would say no at that point. So they felt betrayed. Kennedy felt betrayed, and uh, but. He doesn't stop there, all right? James Wilcott also adds this other thing, which I think is even more sadly indicative of the real CIA mentality at that time. The branch chiefs and deputy chiefs, project intelligence officers, and operational specialists viewed Kennedy as a threat to the clandestine services 
but he says the loss of special privileges, allowance, status, and early retirement that came with the CIA cloak and dagger job were becoming a poss the, the loss of these things were becoming a possibility, even a probability. The prestigious positions of the bureaucratic dominions ambitiously sought might be no more. Adjustment to a less glamorous job in a common profession could be the result. He cites this as why he believes Kennedy was killed. That is astonishing and frightening. You know, Kennedy was going to take their fun and games away. That's really scary. All right, so what did Angleton tell and not tell the Warren Commission? He fretted four months in their own documentation about what Hoover would say to the Warren Commission about Oswald. All right, would Hoover out Oswald as a CIA asset? Or would Hoover be cowed by what Angleton had on him? Or would he try to counter blackmail? And of course, what could Hoover know? Well, one of the things Hoover knew was this, all right? Right after the assassination, the FBI did a very diligent job. They went and tracked the bullets that were found on the sixth floor depository. And they found that they related to a specific order of ammunition, which was authorized under government contract. And they give the name. It says the interesting thing about this order is that it was for ammunition which does not fit and cannot be fired in any of the US Marine Corps weapons. This gives rise to the obvious speculation that it is a contract for ammunition placed by CIA with Western cartridge under a US Marine Corps cover for concealment purposes. The FBI tracked the bullets basically to an order that the Marine Corps had made that they believed was hiding it for the CIA. In other words, they tracked the bullets to the CIA. They knew this in December of 1963. This is why Angleton was terrified, not just this. This is just one of the many things that they knew, you know, that Hoover knew about the Kennedy assassination. All right. Um, I think it was Jeff Morley yesterday mentioned that it's important to know who the FBI people who appeared to be collaborating with the CIA who turned off information about Oswald right before the assassination. Well, Albert Turner was one of them, Bert, Albert Bert Turner. All right, Hoover censured him for failing to follow up on the CIA note, you know, when they made that cable saying, so, you know, Oswald, this man named Lee Harvey Oswald has visited the Soviet embassy and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Angleton not only knew who he was, he knew a lot of personal details about him. It's clear that these men were friends. Burt Turner was a counterintelligence guy in the FBI. This appears to be one of Oswald's, I mean, Angleton's direct contacts. And again, it was Burt Turner who kind of buried that memo about Ho Oswald and made sure no one acted on it before the assassination. All right, if anything, this is probably the most direct evidence we have of a pre-assassination tie that Angleton knew something was coming up involving Oswald. You know, and as Newman has said, it's these documents were designed to raise the threat level, but not to the point of getting Oswald arrested before the dirty deed was done. All right, and of course, Papage, who was, uh, Sam Papage was the liaison from the FBI's end to the CIA, but I've found documents where Papage says, this is too sensitive for the FBI. So really, Papage was more CIA than FBI, and that is why the relations between the FBI and the CIA were quote unquote so good. Angleton really trusted Papage. Pa Papage trusted Angleton more than Hoover and was more willing to side with the CIA than the FBI. It's interesting to note that after the Robert Kennedy assassination by 1970, all relations were severed between Hoover and Angleton. All right, there was a huge break. And I think I have the reason for that break, but that's way beyond the scope of this talk. Okay. Uh, James Angleton called to advise that McCone, director of the CIA, will testify before the commission tomorrow. Angleton said it occurred to him it would be well for both McCone and Mr. Hoover to be aware that the commission might ask the same questions, wondering if they'll get different answers. So this is the famous memo. It goes, one question will be, was Lee Harvey Oswald ever an agent of the CIA? And Angleton says, the answer will be no. Not our answer will be no. What's yours? The answer will be no, <laughs> and so on. There's like th four questions in a row. A ray, he's laying down the law. He's saying, this is what has to happen. Well, when the church committee saw that, they had serious questions. And again, I strongly refer you to Schweiker's session with Angleton on this, because it goes on for pages. And Sw Schweiker asks him over and over, but why did you have to you know, tell them what to say? Why did you have to wonder if there was no relationship whatsoever and there was nothing to indicate that there were? Why would that head up the list of four questions that the CIA wished to communicate to Hoover on? And Angleson says, well, I think simply it put them also on notice that if they did not agree or if they had other information, they would tell us so there wouldn't be any surprises. 
And Stryker says, except this, if he didn't work for the CIA, and the CIA knew he didn't work for the CIA, then there really couldn't be any surprises as far as the CIA is concerned, right? And again, Angleton can never just say yes, which is the obvious answer. You know, the fact was, again, it's, it makes much more sense that Oswald was CIA. That explains this entire memo, this entire operation. Otherwise, there's really no credible explanation for this. All right, I had to pull this off. I, I just happened to look at Jeff Morley's site, and I saw this, and, and John McAdams, you know, one of the biggest disinformationists on the case ever, uh, said, I am not aware of any case where the CIA lied to the Warren Commission, and just my old instincts kicked in, and I'm like, I bet I can find a lie in five minutes, and I did. So here's a provable lie. All right, an article came out during the writing of the Warren Commission that Oswald had several meetings with the CIA representative in the US Embassy in Moscow, and that Oswald was interviewed by the CIA and other embassy operatives. All right, well, Richard Helms, of course, says, not true, just not true at all. All right, he knew what to lie about. Rocca didn't. Angleton's close associate, Rocca, actually didn't know enough to lie about this. When he heard the same information about the same story, he raises a red flag. He goes, the detail which it contained about this telegram was both substantial and accurate. <laughs> and he's worried about a mole in the Warren Commission because that's his mindset. Again, Rock is not close enough to the plot to realize he needs to lie. <laughs> and Helms is. All right, who was that CIA contact? John McVicker, actually. And you can read about that in John Newman's Oswald and the CIA. He was reporting to the CIA everything that Oswald did there in the embassy. Okay, now, after the Warren Commission comes out, there's a period of relative calm in the case. You know, Mark Lane is raising questions, but he's not on the national news. All right, the Time magazine, or the Life magazine with those Zapruder films hasn't come out yet. That doesn't happen until 66. So this is 1965, post-Warren Commission, pre-bursting of conspiracy theories, if you will. But Angleton's team is still trying to tie up loose ends. And again, that's interesting, because he knows this needs to be covered up. And there's this memo, this uh, message that comes into headquarters and it says, oh, by the way, that Cuban consul, uh, you know, Azubio Askew is passing through Mexico, I mean, passing through Washington, D.C., if anybody needs to talk to him, you know, and they say, suggest illicit intel, get Leis reading his attitude toward uh, regime, and possibly involve him in heavy drinking bout, which might cause embarrassment, Askew, in the Cuban embassy. All right, why might they need to embarrass Askew? Well, there was a follow-up to this that came from CI, all right, and it referenced that cable directly. It said, if suitable access developed Askew per ref, in other words, if you do find him and get him drunk, <laughs> headquarters interested in any new info, you know, aftermath info that can be brought to light, Ray Oswald's visa application at the Cuban embassy. The reason this is significant is that Askew is the one who said the guy that I interacted with at the embassy is not the guy I saw on TV after the assassination of JFK. It's not the same guy. He looked very different. <coughs> Angleton knew this was a problem, and so in this period of quiet, he's still trying to find a way to get Askew to say it was Oswald. I find that stunning. Um, by the way, there's another thing that exposes a lie on this document. Um, Pierre Dale Scott and some others have quoted Ray Rocca, who says, oh, the GP floor phase of the investigation. He tries to pass off the fact that there was a code name for Oswald, GP floor, all right? And he tries to make it sound like it was about the Warren Commission investigation. It was not about Oswald. Well, it says GP floor here. And again, the date is 1965. <laughs> All right, that is not, GP Floor does not refer to the Warren Commission. That refers to Oswald and Oswald alone. Okay, uh, and by the way, this one has also been misexplained, uh, where it says Rybat. I finally found somebody who explained it better than anybody else, and he said, well, it's a special counterintelligence indicator, so if the cable comes in with this, it is automatically routed at a high priority and secret level to counterintelligence directly. So it's not just a special sensitivity indicator, as Phil Agee said, it's actually a special counterintelligence, a special Angleton indicator, if you will. Okay, all right, one of the biggest things that Angleton kept from the Warren Commission is the fact that we had a Soviet defector, all right, named Nosenko, who had come over and said that, among other things, he'd reviewed Oswald's file when he was in the Soviet Union before he came here and said not only did the KGB have no interest in Oswald, but they thought he was CIA. Well, <laughs> this caused a major problem because what was the Warren Commission premised on? 
All right, when LBJ got his people to serve on the Warren Commission, one of the things he told them, and this is on the record, he said there could be World War III. If it gets out that it turns out the Soviets were behind this, there might be this worldwide war, and we can't afford that, so it's really important. You know, we come to a conclusion that doesn't point the finger at the Soviets. And Angleton knew that you needed to keep the finger pointed on the Soviets in order to guarantee the Warren Commission's cover-up. All right, and Nosenko came and threatened that. Now again, officially on the record, the reason Angleton hated Nosenko was because he conflicted with an earlier defector named Golitsyn who said, anybody who comes after me is here to discredit me and don't believe them. But I think there were two reasons why Angleton needed to discredit Nosenko. And I'm backed up on that because they gave Nosenko a series of lie detector tests. And in the second one, after the first one, there are many more questions about Oswald on it. And they interfered with him physically, the guy poked him in the anus and did everything he could to stimulate his heart so that he would get a reading making it look like he was lying. And that's a session where they focused almost entirely on Oswald, and I think that's stunning. I don't want to say focus entirely on Oswald, but again, many more questions about Oswald than any other session. All right, now we're almost at the end here. Okay, Epstein was uh, supposedly an early critic of the Warren Commission, all right, but was he really? And the reason I'm gonna ask that is that Angleton's favorite operation was something called the trust. And everybody who joined his counterintelligence had to spend two years studying this operation. It was a Soviet operation. Right after the revolution, the Bolsheviks knew that there would be a counter-revolution if they didn't get a hold of it right from the start. And so the Soviets set up a fake organization that was against the Bolsheviks. They set up their own anti-Bolshevik activation as a vacuum clear to suck in any activists who might be against them so they could find out who they were and slowly neutralize them. It makes sense that Angleton would do the same thing. If he knew the CIA was, was responsible, whether he had any direct involvement or not, it makes sense. He would want to set up a critical community and draw people together and control them from the inside to make sure the finger wasn't pointed at the CIA. And if you look at the early research, my gosh, they were so tentative at pointing the finger at the CIA. And granted, they didn't have nearly the files we have. All right, but I do think that it's possible that Epstein was an asset of Angleton's long before he admitted to being an asset of Angleton's, which was years later. Okay, why should we care? Angleton lied and withheld evidence. He kept the threat of Soviet involvement alive long enough to guarantee the cover-up by the Warren Commission. He was never punished, not even posthumously, as he should have been if we had a responsible press in this country. And if no one is ever held accountable for treason, what is to stop others from committing it? How did a possible conspirator in the Kennedy assassination end up controlling the CIA's dealings with the Warren Commission? How did it happen again with the HSCA? Why hasn't in 2014 the Attorney General prosecuted CIA employees who deliberately deceived the Senate Intelligence Oversight Committee recently? I feel like I'm living in Groundhog Day. All right, the CIA lies to us and gets away with it. They lie to us some more and they get away with it again. They lie to us and lie to us and lie to us and they keep getting away with it. We must break the cycle of a official ignorance and cowardice if we are ever going to bring the CIA under appropriate democratic control. We have to learn the lessons of the past to protect our future. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.